baby boy, yeah, baby, baby boy, you, you are, ah, uh, my pride and joy, ha, ah, hey, what is going on everybody, welcome to another episode of Junior's World of Soul, I am back with the new video, I am back for your part two of the Motown 60s producers. So, y'all know the first joint, when you go back, I'll put it in the more info box. The first part was on Holla Doja Holland and my top five um, Holla Doja Holland producing written songs. Um, number five was um, You Can't Hurry Love by The Supremes. Uh, number four was uh, You Wonderful One by Marvin Gaye. Number three was um, Shake Me, Wake Me uh, Till It's Over by the four tops uh number two was um uh, mickey's monkey by uh the miracles and number one was by uh quicksand by martha Rees and the vandellas now the first video youtube like really screwed me over they messed up my um part where i was talking about marvin your wonderful one and i really went in on that one talking about my mom and all that good stuff and they muted me and it sucks but it's still up you know what i'm saying you can kind of read my lips and see the song that i'm singing but i wish the music was playing behind it but they was acting all stupid i don't know why but um i'm gonna have to do another video definitely representing holla doja holland the right way because they are my favorite production team of all time but as you can see, I came in with Pride and Joy by Marvin Gaye, which was written and produced by the legendary Norman Whitfield. Now, um, I started this, I guess, these different volumes because it seems like when everybody talks about Motown and you talk about the 60s Motown, everybody goes to Holla Doja Holland songs. And I said, you know, it bugs me out because I'm like, listen, you know, Norman Whitfield was on their heels as far as having hits and, and, and giving them to other artists. So I was like, you know what? How about I do um, different volumes of, you know, my top five Holla Doja Holland songs and my top five uh, Norman Whitfield songs. And um, as I feel like after Holla Doja Holland left, it's like Norman Whitfield was the guy. He was the guy that created all the hits after 1967. So I was like, yo, I feel like in the 60s, he's so underrated. So I felt like, you know what? I want to do my top five um, 60s songs that was written and produced by Norman Whitfield. Just to show y'all that, listen, this dude is a legend. Yes, in the 70s, he really became this, you know, top A-lister producer. But... Let me tell you something. In the 60s, he has hits, y'all. So this list that I'm about to do is going to prove that. And y'all going to get some, you know, some stories behind the songs and everything like that. So hopefully y'all got y'all red cups and y'all ready to groove with me. So let's get this started. It's all about Norman Whitfield. So let me give y'all a little background on who Norman Whitfield is. Norman Whitfield, he was born in New York, but he moved to Detroit. And um, when he got to Detroit, he saw that Motown was up and coming you know what i'm saying it was up and coming and he wanted to be a part of it you know what i'm saying so he like was around the motown offices all the time so finally barry was like you know what okay fine i'm gonna make you a part of motown and what he did was he um he he uh he made him part of the quality control group and um what the quality control group is a group of people that he gets and they listen to the song and they feel like if it's going to be a hit or not and Barry had a lot of those. So a lot of songs just didn't go out because a lot of them didn't think they were hits. You know what I'm saying? Man, hey, they could have been wrong, but, you know, most of the time they were right because the songs that were released became hits. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, then after a while, you know, Motown, I felt like was a great assembly line. And after going there, because I went to the Motown Museum actually a year ago, I went to the Motown Museum. It was a life-changing thing for me. If you ever have a chance to experience the Motown Museum, I would definitely recommend it. Like, I want to go back. Even though I've done it, I would love to go back again. You know what I'm saying? But, um, you know, Motown, they were just an assembly line. So Norman actually wanted to be more of a songwriter and producer. So he finally got in and, um, you know, Pride and Joy was actually one of the first songs that he actually produced and, and helped wrote. You know what I'm saying? With him and Marvin and... Um, uh, Mickey Stevenson, yes, they wrote Pride and Joy, and right then and there was just like, after a while, 
you know, obviously Barry started taking a liking to his songwriting and his producing, and it was just hits after hits after hits after hits. So I'm going to prove to y'all that let me tell you something. The songs that y'all might not think is from Norman is from him. So here we go. It's going to get started. So coming at number five is The Valets. Now, which I feel like this song should have been a bigger song than what it was. You know what I'm saying? I love this record. I love what him and uh, Mickey Stevenson did with this record. I think it's a dope, dope song. And I think it should have been bigger than what it was. But it's a dope, dope record. And um, here we go. Here's number five from the Valets. And it goes a little something like this. Wipe it out like that. Hey, make you do the make you do the jerk. Make you want to do the jerk. I love this song, Needle in the Haystack. I really people don't really talk about this song a lot. It's so underrated in my opinion. But I love what Mickey and Norman did with this song. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't a big hit. It like peaked at 45 on the pop charts. But I think it should have been so much like better than what it was you know what i'm saying but i think the song is just so dope and then you can hear the gospel influence that's one thing i liked about norman whitfield and i liked about holla doja holland they put you know you hear the gospel influence in these productions you know what i'm saying because one thing about motown and that was the first thing i learned when it came to motown when it came to my mom who's my music teacher she would always say motown was all about the hand claps and you know, y'all, that comes from the church. You know what I'm saying? Well, we didn't have instruments to play. You know what I'm saying? We used our hands. And you can tell that these guys really put their gospel influences into their music. You know what I'm saying? But like I said, I felt like this song should have at least made the top 20. But by then, you had so many songs coming out. And you know what I'm saying? Especially from Motown. Because the way, you know, um, Barry did it, it was like, you know, at a time you could only have like three songs, um, three songs out for one label. So what Barry did was Barry created so many labels so he can put out different, you know, songs. You know what I'm saying? He had the Motown label. He had the um, Tamla uh, label. Then he had Gordy. Then he had Soul. So he had so many. So these record labels and um, not record labels, these uh you know, radio stations was getting all these songs and you know, some just got swept under the rug and I felt like this song from the uh, Valets, Neither in the Hates That definitely, definitely got swept under the rug because I felt like this was such a bigger song but this is uh, a, definitely a top song for me when it comes to Norman Whitfield so that is Neither in the Hates That by the Valets coming in at number five. Now, coming in at number four is coming from my favorite singer of all time. I'm talking about the legendary Gladys Knight and um, her family, the Phipps. Um, this song is actually, it's a classic twice. And hopefully you guys got a hint why when I said that. Because I'm loving what I'm doing now. Like, I'm not giving you the names of the songs. I'm just playing them and then you should know them by then. But this song was a classic twice and it had to be on my list. Norma did the damn thing with this record, and um, here we go. It goes a little something like this. Baby, baby, I heard it through the grapevine. Oh, uh, yeah, now nah, just about, just about, just about to lose my mind. Gladys. I just love, I can sing Gladys all day long. Like, I love Gladys. But, um, this song is like really kind of what put Gladys and the Pips on that mainstream kind of vibe because, you know, they were part of the label Soul, which made a lot of sense because Gladys Knight has a lot of soul. And, you know, she talks about her being on the label and her 
she didn't feel like they got respected. They got a lot of the hand-me-downs. And they actually did because I heard it through the grapevine was actually done by the miracles. And then it was done by the next person that I'm going to talk about. But he did it first. But it actually, um, Barry didn't approve of it. He didn't like it. He didn't think it would be a hit. So once they changed it for Gladys, they put it out and it ended up being a big hit. And this is kind of when Gladys and the Fifth kind of got noticed. Even though um, uh, everybody, uh, everybody Needs Love was actually kind of the first hit that broke the top 40 that kind of got them noticed. You know what I'm saying? On being on Motown, but I heard it through the grapevine really, really got them that exposure that they, you know, needed. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I love Gladys's version. I love it. But again, somebody in the next year it was brought out and it became a big, big record. And um, here we go. This joint is so like, I can't, but you think about it and you be like, Jesus, both of these songs, you know, are the same lyrics, but it's like somebody finally caught on, you know what I'm saying? And it's just crazy, but here we go. This thing want to act all crazy because it, you know what I'm saying? It want to act all foolish, but it's all good. Y'all like the rawness of this, but here we go. Oh man, Marvin did his thing with that. You know what I'm saying? And it ended up being a bigger hit than Gladys and the um the uh, Gladys and the Pips. They theirs peaked at number two on the uh pop charts and number one on R and B. This did R and B on pop and R and B on uh number one on R and B. So it became a big hit. And thanks to Norman Whitfield's songwriting, this song actually became the biggest single in Motown history. This is something that Holler Dozer Holland didn't get. You know what I'm saying? They had so many hits. But the song that Norman Whitfield wrote became the biggest history. Crazy, right? So you got to give Norman his respect. But I had to play both because, I mean, I heard it through the grapevine. You can like Gladys's version. You can like Marvin's version. It's like, I like Marvin's version, because, but Gladys, there's something about her version, you know what I'm saying, that just really gets me. And maybe I might be biased because she is my favorite singer, but both of them is dope. And this song was written by Norman Whitfield. All righty. So coming at number three is from The Temptations, who Norman Whitfield um, became their main producer. Now, Smokey Robinson was their main producer um, you know, once the Timps got that first big hit and, you know, um, Smokey blessed them with the way, uh, the way you do the things you do. I'll be trouble. My girl, since I lost my baby, he gave them bangers after bangers. But the rule that was in Motown was if you worked with another producer and they gave you a bigger hit, then you ended up working with them. And that's what kind of happened with Smokey and Norman. It was like Norman produced some songs for the um, Temptations, but they wasn't as big. It was like Smokey was bringing out the top 20s. But finally, um, Smokey gave them Get Ready. You know what I'm saying? Everybody, get ready, because here I come. Get ready, because here I come. So that was, you know, it was a hit, but it only hit number 29. But Norman gave the Temps Ain't Too Proud to Beg, and that peaked at number 13 and right then and there it was like Smokey was out Norman Whitfield was in and he became their main producer and let me tell you something after that Norman just started giving them hits after hits he gave them more hits than Smokey did like Smokey maybe had the most rememberable one with my girl you know what I'm saying but it's like after that it was like Norman was busting it out for the temptations and that's how he became their main producer but this song right here is a favorite of mine. 
I think I've talked about it in a lot of my Motown videos, but I love the production. I just love everything about this song. And it's just David put his foot in it. You know what I'm saying? Singing lead. You know what I'm saying? But um, here is number three. Here we go. Like this. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beauty's on the sandy. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sweet. Your words, warm and sincere. Ah. Uh, I, I, yep, I can do, listen, I can do main vocals and I can do background. That's, let me tell you something. If I love a song, I can do both. You know what I'm saying? But, um, let me tell you something. Norman put his foot in this production. It just, it's a feel good record. Like you gotta move when you hear it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and y'all just hear that production? Like everything is, and then here go the bridge. Bring it back now. What do I see in you? Oh, God, I wish I could sing all these songs. <laughs> I can't, but let me tell you something. This song is a must play for me and my family. Like, we always get on our Motown kick. That's one thing about my family. We love Motown and we love stats. So, it's like we get into that Motown feeling and it's a rap. And this is the part that we all love to sing along with this. It's like, you could tell David was ad-libbing, but it's lit. Listen. We love that. Oh, God, me and my mom can sing that all day long. But, yo, that song is everything. Like, it just it just feels a good record. It has a nice little slow groove to it. You can actually have a nice little two-step to it. It's just dope. And I love Beauties on the Skin Deep. And it's a real record. Like, it's honest. But, actually, The Temptations wasn't the first to do this record. They were not, and that's one thing about Motown. So many people did so many songs, but if you got a bigger hit out of it, okay, cool, because actually the Miracles did this first, and then uh, Jimmy Ruffin, David Ruffin's brother did it, but it, it didn't chart that high, but once the Temps got it and David sung lead, it became a huge, huge hit. So that's how things go, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's like I was saying about I Heard It Through the Grapevine. Like, listen, if... Gladys got a hit out of it, but she wasn't the first to do it. You know what I'm saying? And then, hey, a year later, then Marvin does it a whole different way, and it becomes a huge hit. So that's the thing. It's like whoever got the biggest hit out of it, that's who it's known for. You know what I'm saying? So Beauty's in the Skin Deep, number two, come from, the, no, actually number three, coming from The Temptations. I'm sorry, y'all. I went and got me a haircut, had me a little drink because work was a little tough. So I, I I had to get it right, you know what I'm saying, so I can record for y'all, you know what I'm saying. So let's get into this. Um, number two is coming from The Marvelettes. Now, please, like, this is what I feel. I feel like The Marvelettes deserve so much more respect than what they get because Please Mr. Postman was actually the first single to reach number one on Motown. Like, they were the it chicks because Please Mr. Postman was number one. Nobody got that before them. And I feel like it's like, you know, everybody, when it comes to Motown, everybody talks about the Supremes. Yes, they were the, the all to end all girl group, you know what I'm saying? But if it wasn't for the Marvelettes doing Please Mr. Postman, how do we even know that Barry even wants to even do any more female groups? How do we even know that? You know what I'm saying? So I feel like they should get so much more respect. So um, this number two joint, this, again, was produced by Norman. And um, this w song will always have a special place in my heart because, you know, my family, this is where I get my music knowledge from, my love of music, you know, my love of soul music and all that. 
And one thing about my family, we have our 8-tracks, our 45s, uh, our 33s, 78s, you know, wherever you, whatever. We, we have that. So every Friday, we will come home from work. My family will come home from work. And uh, we will all sit around and we would just listen to music. And I remember one day, you know, once I started really, really recognizing what music really was, you know, at three, if you just hearing a beat and you just jamming to it. But then I finally went over to the record player and I pulled out a record. And my first record was this song right here. And I still love it to this day. So this has a special place in my heart. And to know that Norman Whitfield wrote it was just, just dope. So I had to put this on my countdown so uh you know it's a simple very simple production but it's still dope so here's um the marvelettes and uh goes a little something like this here we go I said they're short, one tall, one fine, one's kind, one too many fish in the sea. Do 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 do. Woo! Ah! Uh. Woo! Come on, hey! Do the jerk with me, y'all. Come on! I ain't gonna spill this drink, though. <laughs> but yeah, yo, this song is just—it just feels good. It's a feel-good record, and you know, I feel like. You know, this is a simple production. I feel like Norman was really trying to fill out his production. So some of his early production definitely seem a little like Holla Doja Holland-ish. Even though him and Eddie Howard um, Holland worked with each other. And Eddie Holland is part of the Holla Doja Holland. His brother is Brian. So it's like you could tell their influence was... You know, he was trying to find his way. And I think, you know, a lot of his early work, it's like, oh, yeah, he's working with Eddie Holland. So his production and songwriting kind of sounded like theirs. You know what I'm saying? But I, after a while, he started to find his niche. And, you know, you realize the differences in production. You know what I'm saying? But still have that classic Motown sound. You know what I'm saying? But um, what's crazy about this song is that the Marvelettes actually had a choice. They was able to choose Too Many Fish in the Sea or they was going to choose Where Did I Love Go. And they actually chose Too Many Fish in the Sea because of the, the I guess because of the production, they liked it. They did not like Where Did I Love Go. Hell, the Supremes didn't even like it when they first heard it. You know what I'm saying? They didn't like it, but hey, it ended up becoming a hit. So who knows? What if Diana and, and Flo and Mary would have done Too Many Fish in the Sea? That might would have been a hit too. Who knows? But we know what Where Did Our Love Go do for the Supremes and it took them out of here. And it was like the Supremes came, became the all to end all. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, I love it. I think that's a dope joint. And um, that's why I had to put it on the list. So coming to number two is uh, The Marvelous Too Many Fish in the Sea. We're at the number one spot, y'all. The number one spot is coming from The Temps, which this is one of the beginning hits. For uh, Norman, this song is everything to me. I love it. Um, and again, you know, Norman worked with uh, Eddie Holland on this one, and um, they bodied this. Everything about this song is just perfect. Eddie Kendricks is on lead. You know what I'm saying? I just love the record. Anytime I hear it, I gotta dance. I gotta party. So here's the number one song, and uh, goes a little something like this. Here we go. Asking you, girl, 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 why you wanna make me blue? Woo! He loves me too. Then tell me that we are through. My love for you is just a game. My heart is a pain. Girl, 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 why you wanna make me blue? Oh, God, I can listen to that song all day long. It just feels so good. And when you hear it, it just, it's just, it's just a feel-good record. Like, I wish this record would have been a top 10 song, but it peaked at 26. So, it was still fine, and the guys was able to perform it, but I wish it would have been bigger. But just listen to the beginning. Like, if the beginning doesn't catch you, 
I don't know what to tell you. Like, listen. production just don't come at you like that like you did not feel that production like that song is everything oh my god and then then what i also love about the production is when they get to the bridge like it makes you want to dance at the bridge like just listen like listen y'all Why you wanna make me blue, make me blue, ah, like I told you, I can sing lead and I can sing background, so I can do both, you know what I'm saying, but this song is dope, like, listen, I had to have a cup in my hand to listen to this record, like, this record is everything to me, like, let me tell you something, if you're not grooving to that and I didn't make you wanna groove, something is wrong, like, if I play that record in my house and you're not grooving, I'm gonna kick you out. I'm sorry, it is what it is. I will kick you out and be like, get out, get your mind right, and then you can walk back in. Maybe you need a shot or something, but if I play this record, you better dance. You know what I'm saying? And I will kick you out, and I know I am not kidding, because I have done it, okay? But um, that's it, y'all. Those are the five songs with my craziness that was produced by uh, Norman Whitfield. You see what I'm saying? He, this man has hits. So I know it's all good to talk about Holla Doja Holland, but you got to get respect to Norman Whitfield. This guy wrote and produced some great, great songs in the 60s. So to, uh, here is the top five again. Number five is from um, the Valettes with uh, Needle in the Haystack. Number four is from Marvin and Gladys Knight in the Pits with I Heard It Through the Grapevine. Number three was The Temptations with Beauty's Only Skin Deep. Number two is The Marvelettes with uh, Too Many Fish in the Sea, who I also like Gwen Guthrie's version that she did as well. Her version that she did in like 86 or so one of those, Too Many Fish in the Sea, I think that's dope too. And uh, number one is the Temps with uh, Girl, Why You Wanna Make Me Blue. Like I said, stop sleeping on Norman Whitfield when it comes to Motown in the 60s. This man wrote a lot of hits and please don't try to throw him as just you know, being the 70s guy that you know from Rolls Royce and, and, and all those and, you know, car wash and, and, and all those type of joints. This dude has done some ish for Motown in the 60s, you know what I'm saying? But the one thing I did love about Norman was that he can work with any other producer and get a hit. You know how many people he worked with? He worked with Mickey Stevenson. He worked with Eddie Holland Jr. He worked with um, Marvin Gaye. He worked with... um. Cornelius Grant, he worked with Barry Strong, and um, Barry Strong, after like 1967, like I said, Holland, Georgia Holland left because they wanted their paper from Barry, and he wasn't giving it to him, so they was like, we out, but um, those two actually became a production team, you know what I'm saying, so maybe part three can be about Barry Strong, who knows, but I done kept y'all long enough, I didn't want to keep y'all too long, but um, I'm going to get out of here. That was a joint that was produced and uh, written by this dynamic duo, I feel. Uh, Norman uh, Whitfield and uh, Barry Strong for the tips. And uh, it goes a little something like this. Here we go. How I wish that it would rain. Let it rain. I'm out, y'all. Peace.